thank you. <laughs> Diane had my back. <laughs> right? <laughs> uh, all right, little known fact. One of the most basic things that beginner pilots learn is how to trust their instrument panel more than they trust their own senses. It is incredibly common, which is a little bit terrifying when you think about it, for an inexperienced pilot to fly into cloud cover, which they call the soup. And because in the clouds, the visual reference of the horizon is gone, the pilots begin to make subtle changes, subtle corrections to the angle of the plane, what they call the attitude of the plane, based on their instincts and their senses. Here's the problem. The senses aren't all that reliable. In an airplane, the inner ear, which is, helps with balance, is subject to changing pressures constantly. Centrifugal force keeps the body pressed down into the chair, which can make it feel like gravity is pulling you down, even if you're upside down. Your senses are not as reliable as your instruments. And this is exactly what happens. New, inexperienced pilots feel like the plane's attitude is off. And so they make tiny little corrections, subtle little corrections, even when their instruments are telling them the plane is perfectly level. They don't trust it because it doesn't feel level. They do something other than what the instruments are telling them to do. And as a result, they subtly maneuver the plane into what's called an extreme attitude, which means that the, the wings are no longer level to the horizon, but they're at some crazy angle, sometimes even completely upside down. And the number of pilots that fly out of the soup almost completely inverted is staggering and terrifying. Now, this is a perfect analogy for the Christian life, and if you don't see it yet, I hope that by the end of the sermon you will. We have earthly senses, the flesh. And the flesh is constantly telling us what it wants, what direction we should go, what corrections we need to make in our course and in our attitude. And then we have an instrument panel <laughs> that tells us exactly how to maintain our attitude, how to exactly to stay straight and on course and level throughout our lives. We've got an instrument panel and then we've got the flesh telling us what it wants. And unlike the instrument panel of an airplane, this instrument panel can never fail. It'll never go out on you. Amen. We have another assurance as well. We don't just have the instrument panel, uh, but I heard a story recently of a newly certified pilot who was flying, and he was flying in the soup. And then when it came time for him to come in for a landing, he got really freaked out. He had a panic attack, uh, knowing that he would have to try to land this plane blind. The control tower came on his radio and said, calm down, young man. What we need to do is we need for you to follow instructions. We'll take care of the obstructions. I really like that. I like that way of, of phrasing it. Inexperienced uh, pilots get freaked out in the soup. And what the tower was telling him is, calm down. We'll take care of getting you there. You just take care of doing exactly what we say. We've got a flight tower controller, too. We have our instrument panel, and we have the Holy Spirit. And when we're following the instruments instead of our flesh, when we're listening to the still small voice of the radio control tower, God will take care of the obstructions, the things that get in the way. We just have to make sure we're following instructions and that brothers and sisters is how we can have peace even when we're flying blind in the soup 
even when we don't know what's coming next, even when we're terrified of the landing because we can't see three feet in front of our plane. We can have that peace that surpasses the world's understanding when we're following our instrument panel and listening to the control tower. Inexperienced pilots get freaked out in the soup. Experienced pilots don't. They have peace in the faith that they place in their instruments and in the control tower. They put their faith in those things and they have peace. They're relaxed, they're calm. Likewise, mature Christians have a tendency not to get freaked out even in the worst of circumstances. They tend not to give in to the fear, the anxiety in the worst of circumstances because they have peace in the faith that they've placed in the instrument panel, in the control tower, in God. And that's the Christmas gift that God gave to us in Jesus Christ. It's why we're celebrating at this time of year the birth of our Savior because He gave us the ability to have that kind of peace no matter how terrifying the storm is in our lives. And that's something to rejoice about. And I hear you rejoicing already, and that makes me happy. That's something worth rejoicing about. And our main reading today is all about rejoicing. Let's get to it. We'll read Philippians chapter 4, verses 4 through 9. <clears throat> rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say, rejoice. Let your gentleness be known to all men. The Lord is at hand. Be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving. Let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Finally, brethren, whatever things are true, whatever things are noble, whatever things are just, whatever things are pure, whatever things are lovely, whatever things are of good report, if there is any virtue and if there is anything praiseworthy, meditate on these things. The things which you learned and received and heard and saw in me, says Paul, these do. And the God of peace will be with you. Mm. Amen. Amen. So when it comes to maintaining the plane that is your life at the right attitude, it sure sounds to me like Paul is not leaving any room for misinterpretation. Rejoice, he says. Always, he says. And then, in case you missed it, in case you got confused by the first five words he said, he says it again. Again, I say rejoice. Paul is giving a nod to his Hebrew upbringing here. Now, Paul wrote this and spoke it in Greek, but he was raised a Jew. And I know I've said this a couple of times recently, but how, who can tell me what it means in Hebrew if you repeat the same thing twice in the same passage? Very important. So Paul is giving a nod to his Hebrew heritage. He didn't say rejoice just once. He said it twice, like Lord of Lords, the supreme, the ultimate objective. Paul says is to rejoice. He said it twice. This is the most important instruction in this letter, is what Paul meant by saying it. Again, I say rejoice. This is the, this is the key point. This is if you miss everything else, don't miss this. And what we're rejoicing in is why this passage is the one that I selected for our kind of leading up to Christmas series. We're rejoicing, of course, in the fact that the Messiah is here, that he lives. That's worthy of rejoicing. That salvation is ours for the taking, available to all who will call upon the name of our Savior. That's a free gift of God's grace. Amen. 1 Peter 1, verses 8 and 9. I'm going to read from the NIV just for clarity. 
Though you have not seen him, you love him. And even though you do not see him now, you believe in him and are filled with an inexpressible and glorious joy. For you are receiving the end result of your faith, the salvation of your souls. Mm. That inexpressible and glorious joy that Peter speaks of is the same rejoicing that Paul is telling us in our main reading today because we, right here, right now, are receiving the end result of our faith, which is salvation from our sins. That rejoicing is the right attitude. That's the right angle to fly your life at. And Paul continues on in our main reading today to describe that attitude of rejoicing. He says, let your gentleness be known to all men. Hmm. So this rejoicing, therefore, seems to be an attitude of gentleness, of meekness, which got me thinking about how the flesh, how the senses usually respond in different situations. By and large, the flesh is reactive, yes? It's anything but gentle most of the time. Think about your immediate reaction when someone insults you or someone cuts you off in traffic or when someone hurts someone you love. Reactive, volatile, angry, vengeful. Or think about your initial reaction when something goes wrong in your life. Or when you find out you're sick. Or you can't find a way to make ends meet. Think about the natural, initial, emotional reaction in those circumstances. Think about it for a minute. Discouragement, depression, pessimism, suspicion, blame, anger. These are the natural playgrounds for the flesh, for our senses. What Paul is teaching us today, and he does it pretty succinctly, is that this attitude of rejoicing he is calling us to is the opposite of our natural inclination. In our flying analogy, the natural inclination, the flesh, gets us all twisted up and turned around, flipped upside down in our walk with the Lord. In poker, when a player is losing or loses a big hand and they get shaken up, they call that being on tilt. They're flustered, and then they can't make good decisions. They continue to make worse plays and lose all their money. Not that I'm endorsing gambling, but it's called being on tilt, which fits really nicely with the plane analogy. They're tilted. They're out of whack. They're not lined up. They're not flying right. The gentle, faithful attitude that Paul is describing is what helps us keep our cool and keep ourselves level and on the right path flying straight God's way. That gentle attitude of rejoicing. And Paul gives us the reason for rejoicing in the same verse. Verse 5, for the Lord is at hand. Amen. And that's not only a good reason to rejoice. If you think about it, it's really the only reason that matters. I mean, seriously, think about it. Is there anything you want more than eternity? Now, if the flesh answers that in the absence of the Spirit, you bet. The flesh wants lots of things. But I'm talking to your spirit, to your heart. Is there anything more important than eternity? Is there anything in this temporary world of ours that is worth setting aside eternity to covet something here? What else could we possibly covet more than salvation? Hmm. Once again, the natural man, the flesh, covets plenty. And if we listen to our fleshly instincts, our senses, if we listen to the flesh, there are lots of things that can come between us 
and the rejoicing we should be doing in Jesus Christ. Hebrews 13, 5 and 6 tells us, let your conduct be without covetousness. Don't listen to your desires. Be content with such things as you have, for he himself has said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. So we may boldly say, the Lord is my helper. I will not fear. What can man do to me? See, we have God with us. That's the reason for the rejoicing. He lives. What place does fear have, therefore, in our lives? The answer should be none. And fear has no place. But Peter, Paul, the author of Hebrews, they all understood that the flesh does feel fear. That's why Jesus and his disciples keep giving us instructions like this. One of my favorite childhood memories isn't so much a specific event that happened to me in childhood, but it's the times when I got to stay up a little later than bedtime and sit with Dad on the couch and watch a little TV. I felt like such a big boy. Let me stay up past bedtime and watch Dad shows on TV. And don't think any less of me, but we used to watch like The Tonight Show with Johnny Carson, who I still love to this day, bless his soul. Um, we used to watch old reruns of MASH, one of my favorite shows still to this day. And every once in a while, we'd watch one of my dad's favorite movies, one of which was Butch Cassidy and the Sundance Kid. Perfect, Pastor Greg. Great sermon illustration. It's a movie about degenerate gamblers and bank robbers who womanize and get into shootouts with law enforcement. Good job, Pastor Greg. Wow. <laughs> So no, I'm not endorsing this movie as an uplifting Christian film to watch over the holidays with your families. And yes, I will confess to you that I still love that movie to this day. Sorry, I'm human. I'm not perfect. <laughs> the reason I bring up that movie, though, is twofold. One, I wanted to illustrate for you how much I loved that time with my dad, how big it made me feel, and closer to him because we were having guy time. I loved that. That was just a memory from childhood that really stands out uh, as one of those heartwarming, heart-filling things. So I wanted to make that point, and I wanted to give you that illustration. The second reason I bring it up is because in that movie, Butch Cassidy and the Sundance Kid, there's a scene that kind of really sets the stage for the next part of Paul's message. In this scene, Paul Newman and Robert Redford are trying to escape from an armed posse of lawmen who are out to capture them or kill them. They find themselves trapped on the edge of a cliff overlooking a river. It's hundreds of feet up, and they're presented with the choice of either standing their ground and certainly being gunned down or captured, or leaping into the river below off this high cliff and risking whatever... Uh, uh, danger is in that. So Paul Newman turns to the Sundance Kid and says, hey, let's you and me jump into that river down there. Robert Redford's character resists, kind of fights with him about it for a little bit, until after they argue back and forth for about a minute, Robert Redford finally admits, I can't swim. Paul Newman laughs at him. And he said, what, you crazy? The fall will probably kill you. <laughs> <laughs> See, Sundance was caught up in the fear because he knew he couldn't swim and that was in the back of his mind and he had some shame about it. He didn't want to admit to his buddy that he couldn't swim and he was afraid of what would happen if he'd go into that water and he's paralyzed with this fear so much so that he's willing to stay on top of that cliff and be gunned down. A certain death at the hand of a dozen armed lawmen seemed better than the prospect of going into this water and not knowing what was going to happen. And just so I don't leave anyone hanging who hasn't seen the movie, they do jump, they do survive, they live to fight another day. He was fixated on the wrong thing. Has that ever happened to you? How often do we get fixated on the wrong fear or the wrong thing or the wrong desire of our flesh? How often do we hold back from doing what we know we should do, doing the thing that makes the most sense because of our fear, because of our anxiety, or frankly, because of our anger or our resentment or our bitterness or our whatever. What Paul is teaching us is to set the microphone right there. <laughs> 
what Paul is teaching us is that our fear and anxiety can either govern us or we can govern them by the power of the Holy Spirit. He's telling us don't be governed by your anxiety. Be anxious for nothing. He's not saying don't feel anxiety. That's an impossible task for us fallen humans. We will all feel fear. We will all feel anxiety. We will all feel anger. We will all feel depression. All of these emotions are common to man. He's not saying don't feel anxiety. Don't be governed by your flesh. Don't be governed by these things that are not of God. Especially fear. And 1 John 1.8 is a good reminder there. There is no fear in love. 1 John 4.18, sorry. There is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear. Because fear involves torment. But he who fears has not been made perfect in love. So when we're listening to our emotions, when we're listening to ourselves instead of God, when we're listening to our senses instead of the instrument panel and the control tower, we get fixated on what we're afraid of. We get fixated on the things we think we want or need. And quite frankly, we miss the opportunity to see what God has in store for us. Isaiah 12, 2 and 3. Behold, God is my salvation. I will trust and not be afraid. For Yah, the Lord, is my strength and song. He also has become my salvation. Therefore, with joy you will draw water from the wells of salvation. And we, brothers and sisters, we draw that living water from the well of salvation through faith in Jesus Christ by God's grace. Praise God. And that's how he gives us peace. When we draw from that well, the feeling we get is one of pure peace. It's a peace that surpasses understanding, says Paul. When we discipline our mind, and this takes practice, it takes discipline, it takes conviction, all of which the Spirit will give you if you ask for it. But when we're willing to discipline our mind to stay focused on the well of salvation, then no matter what we are going through right now in our lives, we can rejoice. Again, I say, Rejoice. That's this week's theme. It's what the Advent candle symbolizes. The third week of the Advent, uh, Advent wreath symbolizes rejoicing. Now, it may seem like I'm a little all over the map today. <laughs> stories about pilots, and stories about movies. What I'm getting at is that we all need to find and maintain an attitude, angle of flight, attitude, of constant rejoicing. Instead of the extreme attitude, remember the flipped upside down plane, the extreme attitude of being turned upside down in our fleshly fears, our fleshly sufferings. And there are instructions in our reading today. The secret, which is in verse 8 of Philippians 4, is to master what you focus on. Practice focusing on the right things. Are you more worried about not being able to swim than you are about the bigger danger coming up over the next rise? Are you more worried about what you think and feel and perceive than what your instrument panel is telling you or what your flight controller is trying to whisper in your ear? Because I'm here to tell you, brothers and sisters, what you are focused on will determine the quality of your experience. The thing you're fixated on is going to determine your experience. So Paul reminds us to meditate on the things that are good. Spend time training your brain to focus on the blessings, on the things to be grateful for, the virtuous things, the pure and lovely things, Paul says. 
He's giving us the step-by-step instructions on how to rejoice, stay focused on the things worth rejoicing over. Things that are praiseworthy, which I hear praiseworthy and I'm thinking rejoiceworthy, which is not a word. It's hyphenated. I've used it in a sentence. It's a word now. Rejoiceworthy. <laughs> and that's what Jesus was teaching in Matthew 6.21. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Where you place the most importance, the, where you spend the most time in your thoughts and attention, that's where you're going to live. That's what's going to determine how you live and how you experience life. When your heart is all wrapped up in something negative, in the poor me, in the suffering, in the I can't believe this horrible thing is happening, your whole experience is going to be negative. And vice versa. When you're wrapped up in God's love and God's grace and God's salvation, your whole experience, it doesn't matter what's going on. Your whole experience can be one of rejoicing. Which brings us to verse 9. In our main reading today, Paul's lesson to the Philippians, the verse that wraps the whole thing up in a nice little Christmas bow. The bottom line is, if we trust his instructions. If we follow the example, the control panel instruments of his word, and the still small voice of the flight controller in our ear, we have peace. Mm -hmm. That's God's gift to us in Jesus Christ. Because he loves us. Because he watches over us. Because he wants to guide us in for a smooth landing. Because he is at hand. Because he is risen. Because he lives today, right now. And his spirit is here with us in this room right now. Praise God. Rejoice. Again, I say rejoice. He is in our midst brothers and sisters. Remember when I said those late night TV sessions used to make me feel a little more grown up and a little closer to dad? I rejoiced whenever dad would pat the side of the sofa and say, why don't you come watch a little TV with me before bed? I would rejoice inside. I was jumping up and down. It made me realize that he loved me. It made me realize that he wanted to hang out with me. He wanted to be with me. And it made me feel like he was rejoicing in the time he got to spend with me. And that's a neat thought. That thought comes back into my heart from time to time when I think about my dad. And he's upstairs with heaven, in heaven right now uh, watching Butch Cassidy and the Sundance Kid on a cloud somewhere, I'm sure, <laughs> and praising his Savior. But I think about those times, and it brings that fond feeling into my heart, which got me thinking that if I could magnify that times infinity... That would give me just a little glimpse of how much God rejoices over us when we come sit down on the couch with him, turn our focus and our attention to that time with him. I know God rejoices over us because Paul says it. He wants us to feel a little closer to him every time he pats the sofa and says, come back to my way. Every time his grace is extended in our lives and his grace is boundless and the number of times he's extended it to us is countless he reminds us that he saves us because he wants us to be with him he wants us to spend time with him just as the prophet Zephaniah told us in Zephaniah 3:17 the Lord your God is in your midst. The Mighty One will save. He will rejoice over you with gladness. He will quiet you with His love. He will rejoice over you with singing. We can rejoice, brothers and sisters, always. In all circumstances. That's hard. But not if we're focused on the right things. Because he loves us 
Lord Jesus, as I celebrate your birth, I rejoice in the love that you have shown me. Brothers and sisters, let's rejoice that Jesus loves you. He died for you and he rose again for you that you could live forever with him because he wants to be with you. May we all remember Paul's words, rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I say, rejoice. Amen. Mm. Let's get the worship team back up here and